All right, our scripture reading today comes from the book of Luke. So if you have your Bibles, please turn to Luke chapter 18. I'm going to read verses 1 through 15. I'll advance the slides here. Oh, that's, we need to switch that to Luke 8. <laughs> Can you guys get that back there? There's a typo. That would be a totally different sermon, I would think. Give the sound guys a second. Pull it up here. We got it? You guys got it on the scripture reading too? All right. I think that looks right. Oh, that's 18. We got Here, I'll read it. I'll read it on my phone. All right. Soon afterwards, soon afterwards, he went on through the cities and villages, proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God. And the twelve were with him, and also some women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities. Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out, and Jonah, the wife of Chusa, Herod's household manager, and Susanna and many others, who provided for them out of their means. And when a great crowd was gathering, and people from town after town came to him, he said in a parable, A sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell along the path and was trampled underfoot. And the birds of the air devoured it, and some fell on the rock, as it, and it grew up. It withered away, because it had no moisture. And some fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up with it and choked it. And some fell into good soil, and grew and yielded a hundredfold. And as he said these things, he called out, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And when the disciples asked him what this parable meant, he said, to you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of God, but for others they are in parables, so that seeing they may not see and hearing they may not understand. Now, this, now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. The ones along the path are those who have heard. Then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts, so that they may not believe and be saved. And the ones on the rock are those who, when they hear the word, receive it with joy. But these have no root. They believe for a little while, and in time of testing, fall away. And as for what fell among the thorns, they are those who hear. But as they go on their way, they are choked out by the cares and riches and pleasures of life. And their fruit does not mature. And for that, in the good so- as for that in the good soil, they are those who, hearing the word, hold it fast in an honest and good heart and bear fruit with patience. This is the word of the Lord. Seth, would you come with us this morning? And preach the word to us, brother. Thank you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for this time that you've given us together. Uh, We thank you for your word that you have graciously given to us. And we thank you for your son who has revealed you to us. And we pray that as we study scripture this morning, as we consider what you have said and what's been communicated to us throughout the the 2,000 years since the coming of Christ. We pray that our hearts would be challenged by your spirit, that we might result, uh, we might end this time in glorifying you and thanking you for what you have done. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. First, I apologize for my voice. we uh, we like to share things in our family, and uh, when we got back to the U.S., we all shared the same cold, so I was the last to receive it, so I apologize. But we are thankful of being, about being with you today. Uh, we're honored to partner with you in the ministry in Spain, and I'll share more about that after our meal together. Uh, but we have been in Spain since 2016, and we are thankful to be back here just for a short time this fall. So uh, we look forward to being with you and hearing from you and also sharing what God is doing in Spain. As we read this passage, uh, this is where we will be this morning. We'll be studying from Luke 8, and Luke is a book that was written to Theophilus, but to a wider audience as well, including us. Luke, the physician who traveled with Paul, and we read about him and his journeys uh, in the book of Acts, which Luke also wrote. But Luke is writing to Theophilus, and his goal is that Theophilus would recognize that what he has heard is true. 
because a man named Theophilus had heard something that seemed too good to be true. It was something that was beyond his expectations. And so when Luke gathers sources and speaks with eyewitnesses, he tells us all this and he starts to include names. And he includes references and he says, this is who told me this. This is where we can find this. So that Theophilus could be certain that this good news is not too good of news. That it's fake news. But as we enter in this text, we have to ask ourselves a question. If it was true for Theophilus, it was true for Luke, then why is it that there are times when I sit at my kitchen table or at my couch and just say, I don't know. Can you picture a time in your life, maybe in the last year or maybe in the last week, when you have sat there and you have, your head has drooped and you feel like your faith is either gone or just clinging by a thread? Maybe it's when you're considering your own life and you're thinking, I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what to believe. I don't know where we're going. Or maybe it's with someone you love. What about them? How come they just can't see it? Does God not care? The passage that we're going to look at today answers us in those moments. This is not just a study that is going to be purely uh, mental in thinking about what someone said nearly 2,000 years ago. It is something that affects us today. And as we walk through this passage, my hope is that in the next moment that you sit there and you feel that and you think that, that you will be reminded by the Holy Spirit that this is what Jesus has to say to you today. This is what Jesus has to say to you in your doubt. So, In Luke chapter 8, verses 1 through 15, we follow a pretty standard pattern that you can see in your own translation of the Bible in front of you. They probably have it paragraphed out for you. But we have this introductory paragraph which gives us the setting. Jesus is traveling. He's traveling throughout the cities and the villages, proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God. It's a little bit redundant, but we have proclaiming and bringing. Luke is emphasizing there is a big message to share, and this message is the kingdom of God. And then we we read through some individuals who have been impacted by this teaching, and then we move into the parable of the sower. It's a common parable. It's found in three other or three books: Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And it's very interesting because not only is it a parable, but we also have the explanation. So we have this parable of the sower and the seeds, or the seed, and we have the curiosity of the disciples in verse 9. And then the purpose Jesus explains behind the parables, he says this is to reveal a mystery. It's not something that people have been scavenging, looking to figure out the secret that is there. It is something that is now being revealed. This is something that had had the door closed, and Jesus is opening the door and saying, this is what it's talking about. Jesus is basing his ministry on the Old Testament teaching. He is basing uh, what he is saying on what God has continually revealed to man, and he's just opening a new door saying, now it makes sense. And then he gives the explanation. Here's what it means. But we're going to go back to that initial time that we were considering earlier, and that was when our faith seemed gone for us or for others. And I believe that this passage tells us what to do, and that is hold fast to the gospel. What is Jesus telling us to do from this passage? He's telling us to hold fast to the gospel. When we say the gospel, typically in short hand, we're talking about the life, which was perfect, the death of Christ, which was sacrificial, the burial of Christ, which was final, and then the resurrection of Christ, which was victorious. We're talking about that in a shorthand, but we're talking about the whole aspect of Jesus Christ as king as well. 
Luke, uh, Paul summarizes it in 1 Corinthians 15 that Jesus was, uh, died and was buried and rose again three days later. But when we talk about the gospel, we talk about this good news of Jesus as king come to made, make things right. And we are all desperately across the ages looking for someone to do that. Whether it was the Old Testament prophets who were proclaiming the future coming of the king, or if it's us today clicking through news channels, wishing that someone would come to make it right. Jesus, the king is coming. But we see that we have different words for this in this passage, as was read by Pastor Zach. We have the good news of the kingdom. Jesus ruling and reigning. We hear in verse 11 that this seed is God's word, that the sower is spreading, which reveals Jesus as king. We see then that it is what this word, this gospel, is what needs to be believed in order to be saved from verse 12. So when we look at this passage as we walk through it, I ask you to consider the words of Jesus. Hold fast to this gospel. But the question is how? How can I, when it feels like everything's coming undone around me, whether it's in my own life or someone I love? And here we have the answer. So we're going to look at this passage from two points of view. First, as the original audience saw this and was hearing this and was struggling with it and the disciples were thinking through it, here we have one seed and one sower. And that sower takes that seed and he spreads it on different soils. So we could go back and say, this isn't necessarily a parable about the seed or the sower. It's a parable about the soils. The different ground that receives the seed that Jesus is spreading when he's going around proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom or the the news of the kingdom of God. And so as we see this, we we can see the different reactions of those who receive the word of God, this gospel, that Jesus Christ is the answer. It is not what I do. It is not who you are. It's not what you can garner up or, or reveal from your past. It's not from the parents that handed it to you or the money that you own. The good news is that Jesus has completed the necessary requirements on our behalf to have a restored relationship with God, our Creator and Father. Jesus is the one who makes things right. It is not my self-help. It is not my abilities. It is not what I bring to the table. It is Jesus. He lived in a way that I could never live perfectly. And he died a death that I could never die sacrificially. And he rose from the dead, something I could never do, had he not done this first. And now I am in Christ. I have received this by faith. So what do people do with this good news as Jesus is proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom? I am here to make things right. It can land on different soils. And that's, this is what we're going to consider. What soil am I? We see at the beginning, if we go to verse four, 5, a sower went out to sow a seed. And as he sowed, some fell along the path and was trampled underfoot. And the birds of the air devoured it. It has a quick end. This sowing of the seed would have happened right around this time of year, October, hoping that in the, after the winter rains came, there would be a growth in April or May. So we have the first lands on the path that the sower was walking, and it was trampled and the birds ate it. And the second fell on the rock, and as it grew up, it withered away because it had no moisture. And some fell among thorns, and thorns grew up with it and choked it. So the second is on the rock, this limestone layer that would have been there where it cannot get any substantive moisture. It can't grow, and it dies. And the third grows among thorns, which choke it out. Just like we have to deal with every year in our yard or in our garden, we have to rip out those thorns that can choke out what we really want to grow, whether for beauty or for produce. And that seed that falls, it's a good seed in every situation, but so far all we have seen is seed that hasn't 
accomplished what it was meant to accomplish. And then the final one we come to in verse 8. And some fell into good soil and grew and yielded a hundredfold. As he said these things, he called out, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. This phrase, he who has ears to hear, let him hear, is not just saying, well, if you want to listen, listen. Jesus is saying, you had better listen to what I say. If you have ears on your head, you better take what I have to say and take it seriously. It's not just a whim statement that Jesus tossed in there. This is an, a, an explanation or an exclamation and an imperative. Listen to what I say. This will change your life. If that's the case, then why were the disciples confused? Why didn't Jesus just lay it out easier? And that's what we come to next. Here we have these soils, and, and we're talking agriculture. How is this compared to the good news of the kingdom? Don't we want a new king? Don't we want to get rid of Herod? Don't we want to get rid of the emperor? Don't we want to get rid of Rome from our shores? Let's hear about that, Jesus. And Jesus is talking about planting seeds. We're here for a king, not a gardener. But Jesus is saying, you better listen. And the disciples say, we're listening, but we don't get it. What does this mean? And Jesus explained what the purpose of parables is, and that is to you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of God, but for others they are in parables, so that seeing they may not see and hearing they may not understand. Well, why would Jesus want to do this? Why wouldn't he just want people to know it so they could receive it and go with him? Because the reason is because Jesus knew the hearts of men. If we go to the book of John and we read about what they wanted to do when Jesus fed them bread, they wanted to make him king. Why? Because he was kingly? No, because they wanted food. Jesus knows our hearts are twisted so that even when we try and take something that Jesus is saying, we will manipulate it to, to our ends. We will take good news of the kingdom of God and we will say, what can I get from it? And Jesus is saying, no, this is a shift that has to take place in your minds and in your hearts. You have to realize this is not about you. This is about the king. And so he's giving these parables saying, you're going to hear my story and you're going to scratch your head and you're not going to understand. But to those who are able to see this, that God has given this and revealed it to them, it's going to make all the sense in the world. Because you know what? We don't need a king like you're imagining. You really do need a gardener. You need someone to plant the seeds of hope that will grow in you, that will transform your heart. You don't need just someone to rule over you with a sword. You need someone, a surgeon, to to cut out the sin in your life. You need someone so much more in depth than just someone sitting on a throne in Jerusalem. You need the Son of God. And so Jesus explains, this is what I'm saying. Now you can understand it. They're going to think it that they know. They're going to think they can figure it out, but they're going to twist it like they always do. But I'm going to tell you what you need to wait for, what you need to understand. And now he reveals it. He says, now the parable is this, verse 11, the seed is the word of God. It's this gospel that we talked about, the good news of the kingdom of God. Jesus is king. And the ones along the path are those who have heard it. Then the devil comes and takes it away like a bird eats a seed so that they may not believe and be saved. There are some out here in this crowd who are so distracted by how uncomfortable it was that they never heard what I said. But the the seed was there. And then the ones on the rock are those who, when they've heard it, they receive it with joy. This sounds great. But these have no root. They believe for a while, and in time of testing, they fall away. It sounds fantastic because it's going to change my life. It's going to make me happier. It's going to give me more. It's going to make my retirement easier or some other thing that revolves around me. But there's no root there. And so when all of a sudden life gets harder because their family says, what, you're not one of those crazies? No, no, no. When they get some negative feedback when life gets harder they walk away 
it didn't work for me. The magic pill that you offered to make things better didn't work. No root, no life. As for those that fell among the thorns, they are those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by the cares and riches and pleasures of life, and their fruit does not mature. You have others that are growing up, and there is soil there, but the thorns overtake them. They never produce mature fruit. It's just other things get in the way. Maybe good things. Jesus lifts out the cares and riches and pleasures of life. None of which necessarily are extravagant, but are distracting. And then he gets to the last soil, the good soil, the one that receives the word and clings to it, where true life is born. And he says, and for those in the good soil, they are those who, hearing the word, hold it fast in an honest and good heart and bear fruit with patience. It's those who wrap themselves around this good word and they take it as their own. It's their only hope. This gospel, this word of Christ as king, this understanding of Jesus in my place, he is my only hope. It is what they depend upon as a person tossed in the sea clings to a life raft. It is all they have. It is all that matters. No thorns could choke this out. And Jesus says, these are the ones who bear good fruit. A hundredfold. They produce and they produce. And you see it's true life because it's the seed is accomplishing what is meant to. There's life and there's growth and there's fruit. So if we consider our moments when we feel like maybe we're the thorny soil or the stony soil or even along the road, Jesus has a word for us. He says, hear this word. Hear what I have to say to you. Cling to it. If you sit on your couch with your head in your hands thinking, I just don't know. Know this, that Jesus Christ has given his life for you. You have the potential to place your faith in him as your savior. You are hearing his words now. (laughs) Believe these words. Hold them fast. This term that, that Luke uses is the same term that Paul uses in 1 Corinthians 15 and when he explains the shorthand for the gospel. This is the word. If we hold fast to it, we cling to it, we make it our own. Believe his words, cling to it, obey it, and persevere. Verse 15, it says, and bear fruit with patience. Because one of the differences between the thorny soil and the good soil is that it springs up, but it can't last long enough. It doesn't really cling to it. It doesn't really persevere with patience. In the same way as those on the stone, On the rock, when they grow up, there's no root. And when life is difficult, when the sun beats down, they give up. Persevere in this word. And so Jesus is first and foremost speaking to his audience and to us now as we stand separated by years, but not in our humanity. We are the same as the first century hearers in our core uh, interests and understandings. And he was speaking to them saying, listen to this word, take this word, hold this word, cling to it, hold fast to it. But there's a second way that we can view this. I think it's applicable to where we are as well. And that is not just me as the soil, but me as the sower. Because part of this fruit that is that comes out from belief in the gospel is that we spread it. When we cling to the gospel, is the same thing as sending the gospel out. It is sharing with others. And it doesn't matter what soil it lands on, it's going to go out. And that's what, what was one of the factors of mature fruit. Who are those who are sharing it with others? 
Later on in chapter 9, Jesus sends out his disciples and his listeners to spread this gospel. So we can go back through this passage and see how this affects us. We can share this gospel that we cling to, we hold fast, We can share it faithfully. This sower went out and he sowed the seed. He knew that if there was going to be growth, there had to be seeds. And if there was going to be seeds, there had to be a sower, someone to spread it. So he went out and he spread it. He shared this widely. He he flung it out there. This wasn't the precision planting that you see in the combines of today where the, the hole is perfect and the seed enters in and it's covered over and the fertilizer is with it. This is taking a handful of seed and slinging it around like you're a little kid with confetti. It is there to be spread. It can be shared widely. And it was shared joyfully. We see that this uh, the sower is expecting a harvest, right? Otherwise, why is he sowing it? Why is he spreading this seed if he didn't believe it was going to result in growth? And so when we consider this, the first message of Jesus is to our own hearts. Are you clinging to, are you holding fast to the good news of Jesus, the gospel? And number two, are you spreading that gospel? Are you sharing that? But here's what normally happens in our mind. We normally go through a a predetermined set of factors which will determine in our mind whether someone will receive the gospel or not. That person would never be interested. You just go in your own mind. You can probably go back in the last few days when you looked at somebody and based upon how they looked, you made a judgment into your mind about whether that person was a good person or a bad person someone who would receive the gospel or not, someone who is a believer or not. You, we do this all the time. We factor out, oh yeah, that person for sure, that person definitely not. We do it over a long period of time. We have friends, family, coworkers, and neighbors who we would say never would think that they would, they would take anything that I have to say about Jesus well. Not going to do it. But as in this parable, a second understands we look at it, we consider our own lives as the soils. We can also look, that's not our job to determine whether someone will receive it or not. Our job is to spread the gospel, to share the good news of Jesus as king. It's not our job to, to mess with the soil of their heart. That's not what we can do. That's God's job. My job is to share it. Part of me holding fast is me sharing this gospel. But we sometimes get in these these moments in our lives where we sit on the couch, we hold our head in our hands, and we think, this person that I love will never come to know Christ. It just won't happen. They're too far gone. And we cease to do what is one of the fruits of clinging and holding fast to this gospel and that's spreading it. We just close our mouths. And I'm not talking about being belligerent. I'm not talking about being abusive with our use of the gospel. The gospel in itself is demeaning because it tells me I'm not sufficient. I'm not good enough. So I'm not talking about someone who adds on top of that in their terms, in their voice, uh, being unkind with sharing the gospel and screaming it at someone else. I'm talking about faithfully praying for and sharing with the opportunities you have the good news of Jesus Christ. And I don't think that there's a better illustration of this than the verses we just skimmed past at the beginning. Because we just took it as an introductory paragraph, setting the scene, right? But did you notice the first two verses that Pastor Zach read? And did anything jump out to you? It didn't for me, so going back. But here we have Jesus proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God. 
And the 12 were with him, obviously. Talks about the disciples. But then what does Luke include here? And also some women. In the first century, that wasn't something that a traveler or itinerant preacher would include because traveling pre- preachers, traveling teachers did not travel with women. In the society of the first century, they were not respected or honored. But Luke, speaking to Theophilus, says, this message is true. And how do you know? Look at who Jesus is changing. Some of these women. And then he goes on to list them. Some women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities. Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out. You mean, Luke is talking to Theophilus, saying, believe the message because a lady with a a horrific past is now following Jesus? Is that the type of person you want on the billboard prepping people to come to listen to your message? Is that what you want on your commercial You want somebody who has a past that people blush at? What about Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's household manager? This is the Herod who beheaded the cousin of Jesus, John the Baptist, because he married his his sister-in-law. And his niece wanted the head of John the Baptist. This is the Herod that Jesus calls a fox. This is the Herod that mocked Jesus during the the Passion Week. And here we have Joanna, a woman whose husband is one of the top individuals in Herod's court. And then you have Susanna that we know nothing about outside of, of Luke, we, we don't know anything about Susanna. She's just a person. So here you have a woman who has a horrible past. You have a woman who's at the top, in the top escalon of individuals in the society. And you have a, a woman that we know nothing about. And in the world's eyes, we would say, what do these women have in common? Jesus took an interest in them. What is it that we have in common? Jesus has taken an interest in us. Because it doesn't matter the past that you have, Jesus is interested in you. And so when we are sharing this good news of Jesus, we're casting it just as widely as he would. We throw it on places that we think it will never grow because we don't know what's under the surface, how God is preparing someone. We have a woman who's at the top who we would say, no, things are going too well for her. She has too much on her side. She will never be interested in this because she doesn't need anything else. And that's a lie. The people at the top are the people who feel at the bottom when they're all alone. We know that. We know that no matter how far you advance in your career or your family or your finances, it doesn't satisfy us. Because we're built for more than finances. We're built for communion. And often, that that prestige cuts us off from the very thing we desperately want. Friends who love us and understand us regardless. And then you have a woman that we know nothing about. She's probably like most of us. A blip on the screen of a very long history of the world. Probably, as... Whoever knew her that Luke felt it necessary to include is long dead. Nobody knows now about who Susanna was. But Jesus does. So when we are sitting and hearing the message, recognize that this message is for you no matter where you land in the soils, no matter where you land in the society. This is for you. Hear it. Hold fast. And when you think about the person that you care deeply about, that you think will never come to know Jesus Christ, you realize that that's not our decision to make. We get to share it. We work and live in a field that is 
predominantly Roman Catholic by culture, but it is agnostic and atheistic at its core. And we sit there and we talk with people who just don't seem to get it. Why would we dedicate our lives to just talking to people that seem like closed doors? Because we have no idea what Jesus is doing. It takes a long time, it takes perseverance to finally see the fruit, and we get to be part of it so we can say, you know what, I can't make this person believe, but I can share with them. I can love them, I can pray for them, I can care for them and continually point them towards Jesus because I don't have to convince them. That's Jesus' part. And I know that Jesus can work with people who have horrible pasts, have different sociological factors in their lives, or who are seemingly forgotten. But what we have to do is we have to hold fast to this gospel. I was sitting with a friend for weeks, well, a couple months. We walked through the Sermon on the Mount. We are sitting, it was in Spain. We had read through it. Someone who was interested. This was his first Bible study he had ever done. We had read through the, we had gone through the Sermon on the Mount, section by section. He was coming at it from an atheistic point of view, and I was coming at it from a Christian point of view. And we get to the end after months of reading and talking, and I said, well, what do you think? And he said, I don't know. This isn't like anything else that I've read. And I asked him, well, does it make you want to close up the Bible or does it make you want to keep reading the Bible? And he said, I want to keep reading. That's what Jesus is asking you to do. Cling to, hold fast his word. Lean in on this when you feel uncomfortable and it starts to change the way you need to live and think and what you can say yes to and no to. Don't close it up. Don't let the thorns choke you out. Don't give it up when the sun comes out. Hold fast. Cling to this gospel. Let its roots wrap around your heart. Keep reading, and then keep sharing, regardless of who you think is going to receive it or not. Hold fast to the gospel, whether it revolves around the moment of doubt in your own life, the moment of doubt about your children, or your spouse, or your neighbor, or your coworker. Hold fast to the gospel. Because it is a seed. And while it appears dead, because we're talking about a man who lived and died under Roman rule nearly 2,000 years ago, that seed is full of life. And it will burst forth in fruit if we persevere. So hold fast to this gospel. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your work in our lives, and we realize that we would not be here apart from your providence bringing us into this world at a certain time and place, besides your direct working, bringing us to this place right now, this morning, your preservation of Scripture as it has been passed on through generations through faithful copies, thousands of manuscripts, and compiled in our hands and translated so that we can hear your words spoken to us. And I pray that our hearts would hold fast to what you have given to us. For your glory, in Jesus' name we pray, amen.